Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you, Vanessa, for leading us so well, as you always do. Thank you. If you want to use your little booklet, we're on pages six and seven, if you're a note-taking type person, so you might want to turn to there. Um, if I haven't met you before, I'm John, and I'm really glad that you are here. I want to start with two stories that hopefully will spark your imagination. Um, one of them we're going to watch, one of them we're going to hear. The first one is a story about a family. It's a bit of an old story. It's a story from 1990. Who, who was not alive at 1990? I did the opposite question before. Okay. Um, not that long ago. But you might be familiar with this story because they show it every year. It's a movie. It's about a boy called Kevin. Not that other Kevin that we need to talk about. A boy called Kevin who is preparing with his family to go on a Christmas holiday all the way to Paris, France because he lives in Chicago. And the cousins come and live with Kevin and it's pretty stressful. Things do not go well. There is tension in the household. And as they are preparing for this trip together, I better queue up the slides so we know where we are, um, the conflict that has been simmering comes to a head and there are consequences for Kevin. We're just going to watch a little interaction um, hopefully the sound is okay. You might need to use the slider up or down between Kevin and his mum. You were just getting into it, weren't you? Yeah, <laughs> right the bad thing. And so it is that Kevin gets his wish. There's a storm, the alarm clocks go, it's chaos in the morning, and they leave for France and leave him behind, home alone. Most of you maybe have seen that movie. If you haven't, it's a good one to check out. It's quite funny. So Kevin has to grow up really quickly. Eight-year-old boy needs to learn how to wash his clothes and cook and shop. Uh, more difficult, two burglars try to get into his home and target him because they know the family is away and he defends the house. Lots of fun, lots of hijinks. But it's really about this boy coming to terms and growing up with adult issues. End of the movie, though, it's actually his parents that learn the most because they've been pushing Kevin away. He's struggling, he's treated as a little baby by his cousins, he's bullied by his big brother Buzz, and he doesn't know how to articulate to them and get help, and they don't listen to him. And so they just think he's immature and stupid, and so have no time for his bad behaviour. So this interaction that they have together is a way of both forming Kevin, but also his parents. They learn together, home alone. Interesting movie. First story. Second story is about someone else you might know of. His name is Jesus. Jesus grew up in a home exactly like that. Jesus' home was full of tension from the very beginning of his life. Imagine having Jesus as your son. Hello, parents. How you going? His whole life was a life of tension. For example, the very first time that Jesus is brought to the temple to be dedicated to say thanks to God for this life that we have, Simeon is there and he says, Mary, your life is going to be a life of tension with this child. 
we have these words. His father and his mother marvelled at what's said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. He's a polarising figure. And for a sign that is opposed, so people are going to resist him. You're going to look at your child and see people against him. And a sword will pierce through your own soul too, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. You'll learn about yourself, Mary, and it's going to be a really hard journey. This child is going to be like having a sword stuck in your heart. And maybe some parents here know a little bit about that. Jesus' family is a family of tension. And the very next story which follows this gives an example. It moves on a few years. Jesus is not eight like Kevin, but 12. And he is left home alone. Luke continues this way. When they performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child, that's Jesus, grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. Jesus is maturing. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and people. This is a strange story. Those of you... Maybe some parents here have, have lost a child at different times. Um, some of us have lost child, children permanently in other ways. It's a horrendous thing to have that experience. And so we, we can feel something of the anguish of his parents. When they discover this precocious child amazing all the teachers, they don't say to him, oh, we never realised you were so brilliant, Jesus. Wow! Where did you... They say, what have you done to us? Why would you behave like this towards us, your parents? Are they blaming the victim here? Luke doesn't give that, in, uh, that impression. Jesus isn't left behind, home alone. He chooses to be left behind. He stays deliberately. He justifies that by saying, well, I, I have a, a higher authority. There's someone that um, I must be about his business because my father, as I come of age, I am now working for him. And that higher authority is the one that I have to give credence and obedience to. But here's the thing. Jesus may have been right, but how he pursued this course of action was incredibly immature. He could have just said, I'm staying. But he didn't. It's a very clumsy, teenagery, tweenagery thing to do. He returns and he's submissive to them, but he continues to develop and grow. How do you feel about that? I want to suggest to you that it's not sinful to be immature. I'll just give you a second to take that picture in. Children are not sinful because they poo their pants or they break things in the kitchen or they get their maths wrong or they throw a tantrum. 
because they can't process their emotions. Jesus did all those things because he was a real human child. Jesus was not a spaceman, fully formed adult in a child's body. That's not how he grew up. He developed and matured like every other child must develop and mature. He had to learn how to read and to write, to get on with other kids, to do his chores and to love God, to be submissive to his parents. He needed to learn all those things. He did them well, but he was a real human being. Otherwise, we have no incarnation. Last time I said something like that in church, I got a number of people visiting me through the week and a couple of interesting emails and letters saying that I had demeaned Jesus. It was interesting, the same people that wrote those were usually the same people who would yell at kids in church for running or playing or not sitting still and being serious about Bible study. We must let kids be kids. Children are children. They want to play. And maybe that says to us adults, lighten up a bit. We must let teenagers be teenagers. They grow and develop. Did you know the human brain is still developing, if that thing works, until the age of 25? The prefrontal cortex is not developed until you're about 25 years of age. That's the bit that makes all those executive decisions, that adult behaviour, that says you need to think of the consequences here. Teenagers don't have that fully formed. It's not an on-off switch. It's an ability that grows and matures as the body grows in stature. The amygdala, the part of the brain, which processes fear and anxiety, is developed by about the age of 12. That means that sets teenagers up for stress and anxiety and depression. They are particularly vulnerable for that because the bit that says worry about stuff is not overridden by the prefrontal cortex which says that's out of all proportion. Don't be silly. That's why we must be careful with teenagers. The the biggest brain formation time outside of the womb, and you can see the womb there, is during puberty, when the chemicals in the brain change. Dopamine says pursue something. Serotonin says you're satisfied when you get it, when you get it. But during puberty, the GABA chemical which restrains that is diminished as children grow, particularly in boys, which is why teenagers do stupid things. They have no common sense, and it's normal. They need to learn appropriately. Now, it's it's a a spectrum of that, but it's it's just the way the brain functions. I don't think the New Testament writers knew about that. Most of us don't know about that. But this is the reality of being human, and Jesus was human. It sets us on a loop. That's why teenagers are so vulnerable to addictions. It's why they behave in such moody ways over nothing. It's why they get addicted to their phones. It's why we must keep them away from things like gambling or sex addiction or other things, drugs, alcohol, because that loop is, is working without the GABA to restrain it. Does that make sense? That's why kids behave like kids. And that was the fear of... Mary and Joseph, come on, thing. You make that go for me, turn along that slide. There we go. They were fearful that Jesus had done something stupid or something horrible had, had happened to him. Three leading causes of death for teenagers are what? Accidents, murder, suicide. In Australia, three leading causes of death. Things out of control. And they're fearful one of those has happened to Jesus. But through this experience of having him alone in the temple, they have opportunity to grow up as Jesus himself has opportunity to grow up. They help one another, just like the Home Alone family. Through this traumatic experience, they form one another. One of the visions that we have for our church is not that just we provide stuff for all the different ages, but that we interact with each other so that we help one another to mature and to grow up. In your booklet, can you make that go too? This is not working for some reason. You will read. Can you flick that on for me? There we go. These words. 
This is something about our church, one of these I's, they all start with I, that we are a church of intergenerational formation. Both of those words count. We not only cater for all ages, but seek all ages to interact and impact one another. Our approach to formation is to nurture all by attending to the needs of the other. We all benefit from the differences of our lived experiences as different generations sharing a common life. That's the batteries, is it? All right, thanks, Gary. That's what I want to talk about today, how we do that. I'll try not to talk too long, but you know what I'm like. Anyway, three things I want us to get from these two stories that I've introduced you to. Thanks, Andreas. First one is this. I want us to see a model here of faith formation, and it's taking place within a household. In the story that we read, you see Jesus' parents helping Jesus to mature, to be formed in his faith. Very faithfully, they go every year to Jerusalem to participate in the religious life. They introduce him, they get him to participate. They do what they need to do to help nurture his life. They go with him. They get him to participate, but also to experience those routines consistently. That's what we do as parents, isn't it? Nurturing our children. Situational or situative social cultural theory says that we need to be introduced to things by those more experienced than us in those things. That's how we acquire those abilities. But there's relational dynamics that also are at place. As Jesus relates to his parents, he has to think about his own behaviour. But as Mary especially, and I assume Joseph too, as, he, as they interact with Jesus, they think about their things. Mary's pondering this stuff in her heart. And as you read the life story of Jesus, this conflict runs all the way through we'll see that his family call him crazy for the choices that he makes. They oppose him. They don't believe. They don't listen to him. See how we go. Thanks, mate. They don't understand who he is. When they performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. This is how they nurture him. And what results from that? He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. So he changes. And his mother treasures up all these things in her heart. Ancient cultures were more intergenerational intergenerational than our modern Western culture. You see that, that they're working travelling as a group. Their relatives and friends are also participating in life with them as they do all this stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be that way. But I want to suggest that that is a helpful model for us. This way of being does say something to us about how we should nurture or form the faith, not just of children, but of adults always, by mixing across the generations. It's a model for life as church. I think that's what Luke is giving us in this very revealing, candid portrait. That's how it was for Jesus. Because look at what he does. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. You know, teenagers do that. Why? 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 Imagine Jesus was saying, why? Why? And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, we can say, well, that's just because he's the the divine man and he knows everything. Luke doesn't say that. I think Luke is saying that's the value of children. They've got something to teach adults as well as a 12-year-old. Jesus always modelled this in his own ministry. He was always speaking and interacting with children. He was holding them up as the model of faith. He walks from town to town, taking children with him, and he says, "This is you need to treat these, the least of these, with the greatest respect. And if you harm these children, it's better the millstones hung around your neck and you're thrown into the sea. 
He elevates, he upturns the status of his culture. Often in Christian art, we see the the disciples as old men with beards. The Jesus movement was a youth movement. All the apostles were young blokes, young fishermen, young traders, leaving their jobs, leaving their homes. Jesus was only mid-30s when he does all this stuff. Still a young man. Paul says to young Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're only a young bloke. You are the leader of the church. Don't take any tripe from it. The picture we have in the New Testament of the church is as a body, we've looked at that, or as a family, but there's also the picture of a household, an intergenerational household. That's how they would have conceived of a household. And that's who we are to be. It's best when our natural family and our church family blend together and support one another. There's a book called Think Orange that talks about how that uh, can take place. But, but all of us, I think, benefit from having this intergenerational experience of life. Is that okay? So I think a better way that so often we talk about handing the faith on, the baton of faith on to the next generation, I don't think that's a good image. I think it's all of us moving on together with all of our generations, opening into the future. Second thing, I think this is a measure of our faith formation. And what we're after is what we see in that story, maturity, that we grow up. We come to church not to learn things, to hear stories, to hear facts, to be inspired, to be encouraged. We come to change, to develop, to be formed, into the people that God wishes to be, us to be. To be equipped to live with him and for him in the world in his ways. That's maturity. It's not that you know lots of Bible verses or that you pray every morning. Great things to do if they help you change. If they don't, a total waste of time. You can read your Bible every day, two hours a day, and not change, you've wasted two hours. It's about formation. That's what we see in Jesus. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favour of God was upon him. A bit later, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and people. Discipleship, that word, and we'll look at that in a few more weeks, is all about formation. Learning. To be a disciple is to be a learner. To learn a new way, a new identity, a new behaviour, a new response, a new value, new life. There was an old Soviet psychologist, uh, Lev Vygotsky, that talked about how to do this. And he he talked about a a zone of proximal development. Long words, don't worry about that. What he meant was this. We need things that are just slightly beyond our ability to do on our own. And then we need someone to help us get to that next step. This is how children learn. This is how adults learn. We scaffold that experience. That's what a good teacher will do. To keep pushing the child just beyond their comfort zone, not too far, so that's unachievable, but with their help, they move to the next step. That's discipleship for all of us. That's what we talk about as we meet with one another. It applies for adults, not just kids. But when we talk about these things, we think who is setting the agenda? Who is setting the direction? Because church, like society, is run by the middle-aged. We are the people in power. And people at either ends of the spectrum, little kids or really old people, their voices are silenced. The church needs to be different from our society. We need to value, says Jesus, the little or the least, the orphan or the widow. These people count to me, says Jesus. They have something to teach us. It needs to be a safe space for that to happen. And how do we do that? Flick it on, will you? Anyway, we got our next slide. One means, a means of this happening, is listening. That's what Kevin's family did not do. That's what Jesus' family did not do. He says, how do you not know this about me? How do you not understand who I am? I've been with you for 12 years and you still don't get me. Don't kids say that to their parents when they become teenagers? You don't know who I am. You don't get me. Because we don't listen. 
we don't understand, I think is the actual means by which we grow and develop. We have the next slide. That's that same verse. After three days they found him doing what? Sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. It's dialogue, which is why we often have question and answer in our church. That's how Jesus always taught. He didn't get on a box and lecture. He interacted. Read the Gospels. He's always asking and answering questions and telling stories that fly off. They walk through a field and they sit over there and, oh, he tells a story. It's always, well, what do you think? What do you see? What do you reckon? That's how he expands people's thinking and feeling. I used to get really depressed on a Sunday when I'd stand at the door and people would say nice things. Oh, that was a fantastic thing that you said about that in your sermon. And I think, I never said that. <laughs> Were you not paying attention? I didn't talk about that. And then I realised that's a wonderful thing because it means that person's thinking has taken them somewhere that's useful. They have done their own learning. I've just been the trigger. God has spoken to them, which is much better than me speaking to you. So I don't get discouraged about that at all anymore. Snoring maybe, but those, you know. <laughs> this is what we do. We expand our thinking. And kids have such good questions. We need to value them. We do that internally on our own. We need to listen. This means of being changed comes about by hearing. Are you someone that lets people finish a sentence? Or do you interrupt? Are you a good listener, is what I'm asking you by that. What would others say about you? Do you need to jump in with your opinion? I sit in lots of meetings that go like that. People talk over the top of each other. And no one listens. Listening is a hard skill. But that's how faith comes. It comes by hearing, says Paul in Romans. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. We're confronted with a story and we have to engage with it internally. That's hearing, listening. Not just the sounds pass in our ear, but that we respond. That's what he means. What are the questions? What are the perspectives? What are the promptings? Who sets the agenda? Am I a person who listens? Because if we aren't listening to one another, we will not be listening to God. Because God chooses to speak to us through one another and alongside each other. That's why we meet in church. Is that okay? Paul says that, and I can speak at length, but I won't. In 1 Corinthians, he says, when you guys turn up, everyone has something to give and receive. Singing a song or leading or praying or whatever. You've all got something to offer. It's not just one person doing all the, the star work out the front. So value that. Everyone gives, everyone receives, and the body is built up. But you don't just share words. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you share life. I love the way he describes himself here. He pictures himself both as a child and as a mother, a parent. He says, I am both of those things. And I'm delighted to share with you not just the gospel, the message, but our lives as well. That's who we need to be as a community. Not just religious talk, but sharing who we are. That's how we help one another with our struggles and wrestles. To be honest, to be transparent, wise, but vulnerable. When we do that across the generations, we help each other. You've probably seen these shows, Old People's Home for four-year-olds and then another one, Teenagers. It was a, a study that they made into TV shows, a series where um, little kids from the preschool go to the nursing home and make friends, and then teenagers go to the nursing home. I think it's one in three households in Australia of older people, people live on their own. 200,000 people in the nursing homes, another 200,000 in supported accommodation. They are not intergenerational. So there's no mixing. Who benefits from these programs? Both. It was great for the little kids who didn't have a grandma or a grandpa. But it was great for the grandparents, the older people in the nursing home. Physical health, mental health, all the indicators went up for them. Even more so for the teenagers. To have someone who would listen to them. Tell me about your life. Change their perspective. They measured it all. It was proper studies to say this helped them to grow up 
to face the world that they live in. And most importantly, for older people to be aware of what's happening outside the walls of my room. We can mix in the world and still be blinkered and blind. Teenagers are on the pointy end of cultural change. Kids in high school are the group we must listen to. And I say to teenagers, talk to me and tell me what the issues are, because I don't know. I don't have teenagers in my house anymore. Maybe a few years down the track I will, but, but not now. So I don't know what's going on. And I don't want to be out of date before I have to be. Don't worry if you upset me or ruffle my feathers or say there's something confronting. That's what I need to hear, because that's the world we live in. What does it mean to follow Jesus in a world like our own? Benefits for everybody. That's scientific study. The church has been doing that for generation upon generation upon generation. We represent the kingdom of God because this is God's picture for human society. All the generations mixing with one another and helping one another. My personal story is I find and learn so much more from mixing with people who are different to me than those who are the same as me. People of a different generation, whether much older or much younger, because their world is different to my world. So if you're a married person with you know, primary age kids, don't just hang out with married people with primary age kids. Hang out with single, single young adults or very old people or little tiny kids at morning tea. Talk to them. Befriend them. They'll have something to say to you not just you to them. Because I think the real value in this and what we should take from it is not just the talk. When we mix, we say to somebody else, you are a value. I hear you and your life counts to me. It's an expression of love. So what I'd like us to do as a church, I've given you some theory, is to think, well, what can you do in your life there's some, some questions for our life groups, and that's what we call them that, to discuss. But what can you do to bridge a generation? Do you do that outside of your own relatives? Who are you helping and befriending? Because that's what church should be. What practical, tangible actions can you take to do that? It's why we have that altogether service that comes before this one, because we're trying to model that. But it doesn't all just happen in that hour. It's just a starting point to get to know people. Church isn't about Sunday, it's the rest of the week that counts most of all because we're a household. Is that okay? What can you do as an individual? What can we do as a church? That's where we need to think if we're going to realise this vision of being a church of intergenerational formation. Any questions or comments or responses that you want to make? I'll give you this. One of the vignettes that kind of stuck in the news as I was driving up uh, was a 12 year old boy who was shopping with his mum. Mm. He went back into the woods to get something and he shot the bullet. He got his own. 12. 12. One day. Yeah. 12 year old boy alone in Bondi. Sometimes that doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. Horrible experience. Any other thoughts from anybody else? Questions, comments? Don't be shy. It would be really good to tease this out with each other, to talk about, well, what benefits do I see for younger people, older people interacting with each other? What things can I do or we do together to further this? Because I think it's incredibly important and it is very countercultural. People think, yes, it's a good idea, but how do they do it? What's the, where's the forum to do this sort of stuff? Because you've got to be so careful, don't you, about mixing people. And we do need to be careful in church as well. We need to be sensible because you can abuse this sort of thing. So how do we do that in a safe and, and productive way? How do we mix? Because it, it enriches life beyond belief, is my experience. It's the best thing. It's what I love about our church community, that we're not all the same, whether it's ethnic diversity or age diversity or any other sort of diversity you want to think about.
have found that in having, especially with uh, grandparents and so on, you have, or your parents even, you have always grown. Mm. And so when you get together with other people, then they're so happy that they're able to tell these stories. And these other people have never heard the story. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> we don't want to be those people that, yeah, we've told that one, Dad. We know that, you know, my kids say that to me. So let's find some new targets. Last night I went out with one of my daughters into the city to hear a band. She'd come across this band and she said, Dad, let's go. And so off we get, you know, it makes it a late night for me on a Sunday morning. Oh, gee, it was good. Music was fantastic. But just sitting and just chatting with her was just the best thing where I could say, what's happening for you? And she tells me, and then... She's getting older, she starts to ask, Dad, what's happening for you? And it is so nice. Welcome to Yolo, the Finland age group. It really helps to get to know each other. I encourage that very much. We build relationships by working alongside each other, having a common task. That's how you befriend people. And surprising who becomes your friend out of other doing something together. That's why you, you make friends at, at work. Church, we're a really diverse group. You probably wouldn't pick some of these people to be your friend if you had your own choice. You're thrust together in the household. But then you do stuff together and you think, oh, I can connect with this person. They're not who I thought they were. It's a great way to serve, to do something valuable, but also build a relationship. And you do that all the time, Maggie, which is wonderful. You're a great example for us in that. Any other thoughts before we finish up and I knock something over? So I remember reading about this. Okay, is this one better? No, just keep going. Sorry. Just talk. Okay. Just. Yep. Um, so um, there was a there was a study that put different groups of people in an escape room. Now, um, are you familiar with one of those uh, uni frat groups where, as in, like those yeah those groups where generally you stick together because you think the same, you like each other. So what they found was that um, the when they split up the when they had different people from different frat groups come to make one escape room team, um, they actually solved problems more effectively, even though they reported lower levels of cohesion. So um, even though the frat group had better, seemed to work better as a team, they actually took longer to problem solve because everyone thought so similarly. Fantastic. There is strength in diversity. Do we believe that or not? Isn't easy wasn't easy for Jesus' family. It's not, not easy for any of us. It requires listening and love to affirm the other and appreciate them and talk through our, our struggles and tensions. But that's how we grow. That's the edge where you're challenged beyond what you are to become something else. Let me pray. God, I want to thank you for this church family. Thank you for one another. Uh, we've just begun a conversation this morning and I, I pray that you'll help us keep talking about these issues so that we can pursue new actions together. We believe this vision for our church is your vision for our church, that this is one of the things that you are doing here and we are thankful that we see some progress in that, but we want to see more. We want everyone of any age who comes here to be loved and nurtured and have opportunity to keep growing and maturing. Help us reach out to those who can't come on a Sunday to not forget those members of our family who perhaps are busy at home or in a nursing home or ill or have other struggles. Help us look beyond ourselves. Help us be mature and consider the needs of others before our own. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that in everything you are the model for us. You are still that man God in the flesh. And so your human life has so much to teach us. We thank you that you did it perfectly. But that doesn't mean you didn't have to grow as well. Thank you that you faced that challenge, that you chose that challenge for God to become incarnate, for God to be a baby, a toddler, 
between age of a man. Whatever stage of life we are at, help us to find you in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going to sing a song again. Um, it's easy for me to leave this singing because I've just got to press.